on a birding trip. Really? Oh, wow. Borneo is a wonderful place. I love I love Malaysia. And oh, we saw orangutans were on the rivers up in the mountains, and the, the birds are spectacular. We saw all the hornbills that uh, lived in the region. Just lovely stuff. But uh, wow. we flew back by way of, uh, well, we flew there and back by way of Taiwan. So when you um, end at the airport in Taipei, when we were coming home, I'm sorry to interrupt, plane. Someone but we in are going live. Oh, oh, so I'm sorry, okay. everybody. That's okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna let everybody in from the waiting room. Okay. All right, wanna hear the rest of that story then? Oh, okay. I realize my mask is on wrong. It's not going to stay on if it's on the right. Uh -oh. Oof, it's a... There we go. Thank you. And then I can pause off. All right. I changed the, uh, the shamus oh. just to give it a little bit of uh, a project thing. Yeah. So I think All right. Can... Um, happy Hanukkah, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Zoom. Rabbi is joining us from Lippman Foyer, live in the flesh at CBI. Whoops, looks like we might have lost him. Maybe Cantor can kick us off. Well, welcome everybody and happy Hanukkah. Uh, I am coming to you live from my dining room table where I have been these low, these many nine months or so. And um, it's wonderful to be able to celebrate the culmination of all this light that uh, we have gathered together during these eight nights. It's really been kind of an extraordinary journey uh, that every night we've had some different group of people or peoples come together and share their light with us. Um, so thank you for being here with us. We're looking forward later to hearing from our wonderful noted author, Portland celeb, Eric Kimmel uh, with Rabbi. And um, so Rabbi Kahana is in Lipman foyer. Hopefully he'll get his connection back. And I'm going to tell you about what he was going to tell you. So we're gonna have to do a lot of visualization here right now. But what he was going to remind us of was the beautiful menorah that is part of Lippmann Foyer that is really kind of the hallmark that when you, when you look to that far wall, that that's what you see. It's, it's a life-size kind of over six feet tall, uh, beautiful, elegant, uh, statuesque menorah that is one of the only things that survived from what we call fondly the second temple, which was the beautiful temple Oh, and he's back. There it is. Thank you, Kim, for telling, telling the story. Um, uh, sorry about that. that uh, back in uh, 1926, when the temple burned down, it all, they also took its Wi-Fi with it. So uh, we've had, we've had uh, cognition, connection problems ever since. Um, the thing that I want to remember with this Hanukkah yeah. and to see it now with all of its nine lights brightly lit, is that this physical object stood at the temple during the last pandemic between uh, in, on Hanukkah in 1918. And as war was raging, and as a pandemic was raging, our congregants were undoubtedly frightened um, and feeling a sense of loss. And this Hanukkah, this very object gave light to our congregation over a hundred years ago. And we are continuing to bring light in a time that is also frightening, but we are beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. And we're recognizing we all have a responsibility to continue 
to bring that light, to wear our masks, to keep everyone safe, to keep our social distance, but to also keep hope. We know that we may be going through difficult times, but it will be better soon. We will be together soon. And with God's help, next Hanukkah, we will all be together again. Cantor? Amen to that. I'm going to lead us all in lighting our the eight lights. So if you are sitting somewhere near your Hanukkah, I'll invite you to take your shamash and light it. And then we can sing the blessings together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher kiddishanu v'mitzvotav V'tzivanu l'hadlik ner Shechanukah Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam she'asa nisim l'avoteinu b'yamim ahem b'azman hazeh ma'osoi yeshuati Lehana el shabeach, tikon bet filati, visham toda nizabeach, litochid matbeach, mitzam nabeach. Hatzeg mor, bishi mizmor, Chanukat o mizbeach. Hatzeg mor, bishi mizmor, Chanukat o mizbeach. And now Chelsea is going to show some of the wonderful Hanukkah collaborative video that we made during this season. Uh, thank you to all of our congregants for participating, as well as to uh, Cantor Raina Green and Kim Schneiderman and Michael Allen Harrison.
Oh, Hanukkah, Hanukkah, come light the menorah. Have a party, we'll all dance the hora. Gather round the table, we'll give you a treat. Sissy boys, we play with the lucky lady. And while we are playing, the candles are burning low. One for each night, they said. I could play mahjong with my friends on any given day. Oh, dreidel, 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 you would not spin or play. I want to play mahjong with my friends on any given day. Oh, dreidel, 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 I made it from a book. And when it's dry and ready, it'll teach me how to cook. Dreidel, 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 I made it out of wood. And when I return, it should be very good. I have a little dreidel. I made it out of schmaltz. But when I try to spin it, it only wants to waltz. So dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. I made it out of schmaltz. But when I try to spin it, it only wants to waltz. Oh, dreidel, 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 I made you out of gold. But when I tried to eat you, all you did was melt. Happy Hanukkah! Hanukkah Sameach, everyone! Happy Hanukkah from the Kahanukkahs! <laughs> Lamaka! everyone thank you to everybody who participated in those fabulous videos um that was that was really uh so much fun um wonderful to see everybody we miss you we miss being able to see you in person but we're so glad that we can celebrate 
this Hanukkah with you. Um, and uh, many of you I know have been with us for each of the eight nights. We've had lots of really wonderful programs every night. Thank you to all of our uh, clergy and staff who have put these programs together. But um, we saved the best for last. What can I tell you? On this night with all of our uh, nine candles flaming, we uh, have this great pleasure to welcome uh, someone who's very special, I think, in, in all of our hearts. So um, it is really great uh, pleasure for me to introduce our guest today and a brief conversation, and maybe we'll have some question and answers uh, together uh, afterwards. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome a uh, 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 world-renowned uh, artist. He has been uh, telling me today, this every, every night of Hanukkah, He's been interviewed by some other uh, uh, some other TV station or synagogue or something. We're very fortunate that we have him here for the eighth night. Eric A. Kimmel, author of over 150 books for children, including great classics like Anasi and the Moss Covered Rock, and the 1990 called uh, 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 Cal Calcott Award Honor Book, Herschel and the Hanukkah Goblins. I think many of us are very familiar with this book. We've read it at Temple in past Hanukkahs several times. Um, this is really, I think, the classic that everyone knows. But if that's the only book you know, Vera Kimmel, you are missing out, my friends. Zigazak, also one of our favorites that's around here. <laughs> We've used it lots of times um, with some terrific effects, and we get all the kids all together to say... Zigazak! And the room shakes. But it's not only Hanukkah. Um, Gershon's Monster for the High Holidays, which actually is the first Eric Kimmel book I ever came across uh, and used it for High Holiday storytelling. A Jar of Fools for, um, uh, for eight Hanukkah stories. Why the Snake Crawls on Its Belly. A Cloak for the Moon. It goes on and on and on. But one that I really love uh, is not a Hanukkah or a holiday book or even a children's book. But this is a book maybe you haven't come across. Wonders and Miracles, uh, a um, Passover Haggadah with retellings from many, many different artists. But, uh, but it's a really beautiful Haggadah with incredible illustrations all the way through. And I want to share with everyone, um, if I can, just a little bit of this statement about uh, Dayenu that I found really particularly interesting. Uh, our author writes, the Haggadah is full of rousing songs. Dayenu is one of the most popular. It first appears in one of the earliest Haggadot, that of Rabbi Sadia Gaon, which was compiled in Baghdad in the ninth century. This means it came from the, came, comes from the same place and time as the story of the Arabian Nights. It is at least a thousand years old. Dayenu means it would have been enough. We praise God for all the blessings God has given us. Even if God had only given us just one of these, it would have been enough. I love that introduction, Eric, because um, setting Dayenu, a song that you know we sing every year and we probably just assumed it was from you know a 19th century ditty, uh, and maybe the melody is, but that it's a song that is contemporaneous with the Arabian Nights, uh, just makes it so much more special to me. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this Passover when I can tell that story uh, along with other stories. So to enhance all of your, everybody's uh, Passover as well as your Hanukkah, I'm gonna recommend uh, some of these great books. We're also doing this interview today um, with thanks to Powell's Books um, and especially to our, our congregant, Emily Powell, um, who helped to make this possible. And we're going to put a link, uh, if we haven't already, in the chat um, to Powell's Books and places where you can buy some of these books. Um, and we're absolutely um, recommending, recommending that you do. And uh, you know, give Amazon a break. They're doing just fine. Yeah, Let's do some uh, some of our local uh, uh, incredible booksellers, uh, particularly Powell's Books, uh, and give them some business. So you can do your Passover shopping a little bit early now. 
Um, it is a great pleasure to welcome our friend, uh, um, noted author, uh, a great Jewish soul um, into our congregation and into our community, Eric Kimmel. Eric, welcome. Thank you, Rabbi. It's my pleasure to be here. I've done a lot of programs for you. I remember the one we did on Jewish gangsters with Ron Silver and Jewish pirates too. So I consider this just a continuation. What do you want to know? I came here to talk. I can, That's so fantastic. One nice thing is you get to hear all the stories behind the stories. So go yeah. ahead and ask. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Yes, I, I, the pirates, uh, I hope Ron is, uh, is on listening to us. Uh, the pirates event was a lot of fun. Um, that was, uh, I, I particularly, uh, particularly enjoyed that. Um, and you're just a great storyteller. Uh, just to start us off, tell us a little bit about your childhood, your Jewish upbringing. What were the stories that you heard as a child and, and what children's books were read to you? Oh, well, that's a good place to start. Um, when I was growing up, I thought my growing up was pretty normal. But uh, given the times, the years that have passed, it probably was unique. Uh, I grew up, as I say, in the old country, Brooklyn, New York. I'm a native Brooklyner, and as Brooklyn as can be, right in the heart of Brooklyn, Flatbush Avenue. But it was a different place than when I, when I was growing up. Um, it was a very polyglot neighborhood. And as I've often said, I could hear five different languages walking from one end of my block to the other. Uh, the Petersons next door to us were Armenian. Uh, Mrs. Lightcap next door was uh, Puerto Rican. I could hear Spanish through the walls of my house. The Schroths were Jewish. Um, there was a German family, an Italian family. So, I mean, I just grew up with languages and stories and I, I sort of absorbed them almost through the air. And then uh, our grandma, my grandma lived with us and I had an old country grandma. And it wasn't just that she was an immigrant. It's that uh, it's a matter of where she came from. She was a uh, Galiziana. And if you know the Jewish world, the Galitskis have a reputation for telling stories. They also have a reputation for being big liars, too, um, and not as studious as they should be. Uh, Galicia is where Hasidism began. The Baal Shem uh, began his, uh, his work in Kuti, which is about 20 miles down the road from my grandma's town in Kolomea. And my grandma was in her 30s when she came here, and she did not like America one bit. Her heart was in the old country. Uh, to the day she died, she kept two postcards on her dresser. One was of Kaiser Franz Josef, the Austrian Kaiser, whom she adored. And the other one, whom she considered like a movie star, was Kaiser Wilhelm, because she lived in Zanzig, Danzig, in Germany for eight years. And I mean, she was a registered Democrat, but in her heart, she was a monarchist all the way. And also she uh, came from an interesting family because her mother had a lot of yichas. She was uh, uh, the daughter of a very respected rabbinical family in a neighboring town, Drobich. And her father, uh, my great grandfather, was uh, grabbed off the street when he was 16 years old and he was in the Austrian army for eight years. And in those eight years, he was also a Batman to the general. Um, remember Mr. Bates and Downton Abbey, the Earl's valet? Well, my great grandfather fulfilled that role to the general. And when you're the general's right-hand man, nobody says boo to you. So rather than uh, traumatized ghetto Yedin, uh, like the people who came from Russia, um, my grandma came from people who were very arrogant. They didn't like the look of you. My grandpa would take his stick and beat you over the head. Uh, as my older cousin said, he was a martinet. And in our house, I got grandma's version of history, which was uh, very different from what I learned in school, especially when we got to World War I. I had to keep my mouth shut because uh, our heart was with the Kaiser and the Central Powers. I was also fortunate in that uh, grandma had never bothered to learn to speak English and she spoke Yiddish to me. So I was bilingual as a child. I never had a babysitter. And uh, until my parents came home from working, 
I was essentially speaking Yiddish to my grandma. And she was a great storyteller. And that's where I heard the Herschel Ostropolia stories, the Helm stories, and also lots of stories about her life, but she also liked scary stories. And as I tell kids, you know, most fairy tales end with and they lived happily ever after. In my grandma's case, hardly any story ended like that. I can't even think of one. They were usually that they were usually stories about kids who didn't listen to grandma. <laughs> and they ended like this. And they found them in the woods in the spring after the snow melted. <laughs> but the worst one was, and they were never seen again. <laughs> so all this terror was delicious. And I grew up with stories. I love to read. Uh, I love Grimm's fairy tales. I love Dr. Seuss. And uh, I was just surrounded with stories. The library was in walking distance for 15 cents. I could get on the bus, go to the main public library, the Brooklyn of the Brooklyn uh, main public library, which is a huge uh, Art Deco building, absolutely beautiful structure with acres and acres of books. I was in heaven. And so uh, I just absorbed stories. And I always had in the back of my mind that somehow I'd be an author one day. And then one day I was out of college and it was, okay, come on, here you are, do something. And that is a terrifying moment. Most people never get past that. But I took a deep breath and started writing stuff and sending it out. And I seem to be getting some feedback from the true, true romance stories I was writing. So had things gone another way, I could have been the king of Harlequin novels. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I was a graduate student working on my degree in education at Illinois, I had a wonderful library science professor, Winnie Ladley, and she turned me on to children's books. And as soon as I picked them up, it's like, here's this treasure I haven't seen since I was a kid. And they're wonderful books here. And I thought, oh gosh, this is what I want to do. And so uh, I just jumped in and started writing. You write, you write, you write. And uh, basically it took me 14 years to get anywhere. And um, really the breakthrough book was Herschel and the Hanukkah Goblins. And that began as a story for Cricket Magazine. Now, here's the thing that relates to today. Uh, we tend to put people in boxes. We talk about diversity, but what it means is, you know, you go in this box, you go in that box, you go in that box, a cultural misappropriation, stay in your box, that I never really believed in. Because um, Herschel's would never have come into print. You wouldn't be reading that book and I might not have a career and I wouldn't be sitting here if it hadn't been for people who weren't Jewish. Um, I wrote this funny little story, and what I did was I set out to write a Hanukkah story because I thought most of the ones that were around were kind of boring. Yeah, they're okay, and you like the all-of-a-kind family books, but, I mean, when you're a little older, I, uh, come on, I want something with a little excitement. I want to write a story as exciting and as scary as the ones my grandma told so I put some things together. One was Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And I always loved A Christmas Carol, especially the old black and white film version with Alistair Sim, which is the creepiest of all of them. And those ghosts who come Christmas past, Christmas present, and then the worst one of all, Christmas future, points to Mr. Scrooge's grave. That was just so scary and delicious. So I thought, all right, I want to write a Hanukkah story. So why don't I use a Christmas carol as my model? Okay. Then there was a Ukrainian story I liked called Ivanko the Bear's Son. And one of the things he does is he fools a goblin who lives in a lake. And I thought, all right, take that goblin, multiply him eight times. And I have kind of a Hanukkah story, but I need another hero. Who am I going to use? Well, a Jewish hero, Herschel Ostropolia because he's smart and he's clever. He'll fit the story. So then it was a matter of thinking of different goblins for different nights. And then how is Herschel going to fool the king of the goblins? Because he's not a fool. Have to change the pattern of the story. 
So I thought about all the schoolyard bullies I knew when I was a kid. And they always worked the same way. They only picked on people who played the game. If you were scared, they picked on you and they were merciless. But if you weren't scared, they backed off. So I thought, oh, the king of the goblins wants Herschel to be scared. He wants him to beg and plead. And of course, then the king would be merciless. But if Herschel isn't scared, it's not working. I got to scare you. And in the effort to scare Herschel, he pays no attention to what he's doing or what's going on around him. He lights all the candles and uh, his power is gone. Herschel doesn't have to be afraid of him anymore. So I had this funny story that I kept sending out. Nobody wanted it. No Jewish editor would touch it. It was too weird. Didn't look like any Hanukkah story anybody had ever seen. Um, but I had been writing stories for Cricket Magazine and Mariana Karras, who, by the way, grew up in Hitler's Germany. And uh, as a teenager, she was packed off to France to man an anti-aircraft gun. You know, great, great government. They sent 15-year-old girls uh, off into combat. Uh, but Mariana Karras was always a friend and supporter. And she called me up one day. She says, I need a Hanukkah story. Do you have anything? I said, I don't know. I just have this funny old story that nobody wants. She said, send it to me. I'll look it over. Maybe I'll like it. If not, maybe you can work on something else. So I said, fine. I sent her the story. And then she immediately called me back. She said, I want this. This is a great story, but it's too long. In the magazine world, you're limited in space. And she said, I can give you 1,800 words, but no more than that. The story was like 2,500 so I thought, okay, what do I do? I could say, my precious work. It's like you're asking me to cut off an arm. Or I could say 1,800 words, get rid of some of the goblins, chop, chop, stitch it together. So that's where the missing goblins went. On the other nights, on the next three nights, other goblins came. They were all terrible and fierce. Those are the missing goblins. They weren't that great, so uh, nobody's losing anything. Um, and then it was published in Cricket, December 85. In fact, this is the issue. Wow. wow. And I remember Cricket Magazine. Everybody see? With Santa on the front. With Santa, of course. <laughs> and let's see if I find some of the illustrations. Yeah, this was Trina Hyman's first crack at it. That's the King oh, of the that's... Goblins. Wow. These are Trina's first pictures. Yeah. And then, uh, boy, I was thrilled when the book came out, and I never knew that Trina Hyman would be illustrating it because I'm she was one of the gods in my firmament. I just always loved her artwork. And uh, my friend Mary Laughlin, who lives close by, said. It almost looks like she's planning it as a picture book. You should write to her and ask if she wants to do it. So I did. And Trina wrote back to tell me she already showed it to her editor, Marjorie Kyler and John and Kate Briggs, the publishers at Holiday House. And they wanted it. So Holiday House brought it out in uh, 1989. Nobody at Holiday House is Jewish. Marjorie comes from an old Dutch family that goes back to Peter Stuyvesant in New York. Uh, John and Kate Briggs are uh, Episcopalians, but they love books and they knew a good story. And that was my breakthrough because all they saw was the story and they couldn't think of, and they weren't even aware of all the objections that the Jewish community would raise. And believe me, they raised plenty of objections. But for the objections they raised. Oh, they said it was too scary. One person said, we don't have goblins in our traditions. Oh. Right. Like my grandma didn't tell me a million stories. She didn't spit on my head three times if someone gave me the evil eye and never heard the word Kanaara. We don't have any superstition. I got a book on my shelf, Joshua Trachtenberg's Jewish Magic and Superstition. We've got tons of them. But we sort of swept them under the rug. No, we're, we're modern. We're Americans. Um, but I love that old stuff. And that's what I was mining in uh, the story. And I, I got a lot. Of, yeah, go ahead. You, I want to talk a little bit about that, if I may. The, the, this, this whole, the, I, I, this 
idea that, uh, that we're too modern and we don't have any of that, and that's not part of our history, um, I think actually many Jews uh, would be surprised at how rich our history is in these, what we call today superstitions, but that acknowledgement of the, of, of the magical, of the demon, um, I don't recall goblins as being uh, characters that are in, in Trachtenberg. Trachtenberg, anybody who's interested in this subject, is the classic uh, book on the subject from the 60s, I think. Um, but it's, it's very, very rich. Um, one of my favorite Talmudic quotes on this subject, I wanted to share with, uh, with people, um, just in case they have not come across this. I've taught this many times. Um, this is from the Talmud, Masechet Brachot, the first tractate of the Talmud. Uh, and it's, the, the, it's mostly about blessings, brachot, it's blessings. Um, and in the midst of it, it says, it has been taught, Abba ben Yamin says, if the eye had power to see them, demons, that is, no creature could endure the demons. Abaya yeah. says, they are more numerous than we are. And they surround us like a ridge round a field. Rabbi Chuna says, everyone among us has a thousand on his left hand and 10,000 on his right hand. Rabbi says fatigue in the knees comes from them. The wearing out of the clothes of the scholars is due to their rubbing against them. The bruising of their feet comes from them. The rabbis saw that, that we, were, we live in a demon-infused world. They're all around us all the time. We can't see them. They, the Talmud actually has magical formulas that can, you can put drops in your eyes that allows you to see them, but it doesn't recommend it because you'll go crazy. <laughs> if you them. And they're, they're surrounding it and they're, they're even affecting us. They're wearing out our clothes. Why do we go through our clothes so quickly? It's because demons are always tugging on us and giving us truth. Our tradition is rich in, these, in, in this world, which is when I first picked up Herschel, I said, oh, this guy gets it. He actually, he really understands that this is authentic to our Jewish tradition. So uh, telling me that this came from your grandmother's stories was, was, was a really great beginning. But I want to learn more about that from you. Did you, did, did you read Trachtenberg? Did you get some of the images from that? Did you, did, was it just in the air that you breathed or did the, was this idea of a demon infused world something that kind of came to you over time? Well, the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I grew up with this and you know, naturally we had a mezuzah on every uh, room in the house, but especially on the bedroom. And grandma taught us a little prayer. You put your fingers on the mezuzah and you say it like this, in her dialect, Shadi yishmareni matzileni mietzahoru umikolru, which uh, is pretty basic Hebrew, Shadi, protect me, guard me from the inclination to do evil and to all evil. Um, but the purpose of saying that was to keep the shadim, the shadows, out of your room. Um, one story I always like to tell is uh, my brother got a book of shadow puppets out of the library. We were making shadow puppets on the wall. And grandma comes out of the room and she just about hits the ceiling. She grabs the book out of my brother's hand, belts him across the head with it, and says, what are you doing? We're just, you know, playing with shadows. You must never play with shadows. Don't you know what they are? They're shaitan. They're evil spirits. They'll come off the wall. They'll grab you and pull you in. Now, imagine going to bed with that at night. Ah! So I grew up with this rich terror that at the same time was very familiar. I also had a very good Jewish education. Uh, went to the Smidwood Jewish Center right through high school really, until I went off to college. And I had a special interest in uh, Jewish folklore, uh, Jewish history. So as a college student, I came to Trachtenberg. And what I found in Trachtenberg and Gershom Shalom too, is a reaffirmation of all the stuff I had picked up when I was a kid. It wasn't like I was entering an unexplored territory. It was like 
oh yeah, I remember that. I remember that with the red thread. And I remember these little prayers and these little amulets. And so I felt at home in this strange world. And I think because of that, I could create a story about it. Now, on the other hand, it's interesting that Herschel has never been translated into Hebrew. There's never been an Israeli version. That's very interesting. Why, I've got that? versions from all over the place. I even have the Russian version close by, but uh, not Hebrew. And I think because ultimately it's an American story. Uh -huh. In the Orthodox world, it doesn't make sense. A synagogue is never outside a town on top of a hill. Right. They're that's, in the community. The right. And they're never abandoned because you had to bribe the authorities to get permission to build another one. That's why they were repaired constantly over, over centuries. But what is on top of the hill? Frankenstein's castle. I'm a kid of the 50s. I grew up with horror movies. <laughs> you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> Dracula. I mean, I, I saw them all. It reminds me of the battlements of my own castle in Transylvania. I mean, I saw every like, Bela Lugosi movie that was ever made. So when I'm writing this story, I'm going back into classic horror movies and putting the old shul on top of the hill with the lightning striking around, dark, creepy, scary. I'm drawing on that. And I think that's why it never went into Hebrew because uh, in Hebrew, you have enough Orthodox people to say, what, what where's a shul on top of a hill? This doesn't make any sense. Um, so- And, and the modern Israelis probably, don't, like modern Americans, don't have that, <coughs> that tradition of Jewish superstition. They don't, they don't have those characters as part of their, their reality. So it would be as part of Jewish culture. So it, it, it probably would come off very strange. Well, Interesting. But, you know, it's still, like you said, Rabbi, it's still part of us. This is part of our tradition and there's nothing to be ashamed of. I don't have to believe in these, like demons are all over the place, but you acknowledge that, yeah, this is how people thought at the time. And this is how they explain things when they really didn't have any scientific uh, information to back them up. It was demons and angels and spirits and amulets working together. And magical incantations. Yeah, like uh, all kinds right. of stuff to, to control a very scary world. Okay. Um, so, I mean, all of that is going into Herschel and the Hanukkah goblins, but the, the important thing about the story is Herschel is the little guy. He has nothing. And when I talk to kids about the story, I ask them, what's different from Herschel than the superheroes that you know? And kids are very smart. They say, he doesn't have any superpowers. And I say, you know, that's right. And you know what? Neither do I, and neither do you. If you're waiting for someone with superpowers to come along and solve your problems and save you, you're going to wait a long, long time. Um, we solve our problems with what we have in here and what we have up here. And it's courage that makes Herschel succeed. Uh, not some supernatural assistance from Batman or Superman or uh, anybody beyond. He has no magic wand. Uh, it's just him and the goblins. And the goblins, were they, they were fun to create. The, uh, you start with a little one who has a big mouth, and then you go through all the others. And I threw in some of my favorite stuff there. Pickles, dreidels. <laughs> Finally, the king of the goblins shows up. This is, this is the boss. Well, let's see how Herschel is going to handle him. Well, I've talked for a while. Got another question? No, that's beautiful. And, and uh, you know, I think this is this is a fascinating uh, uh, segment. You know, you we, you've got the goblins from Herschel, and then you have the goblins in Zigazak as well. Uh, who who you, they get? They're a little more of the trickster goblins, like that. They have this responsibility to play tricks. Like that, yeah. that's what they were created for, right? To go around and, and, and mess things up, which actually both, both Herschel and those goblins reminded me of some Native American stories as well. Mm -hmm. That notion of the, uh, of the trickster mm -hmm. and, and the one who outwits, uh, you know, the, the opponent that it's all, you know, you say that 
that Herschel doesn't have any superpowers. He, he has his cook. He's got his intelligence. He's got his yidish and, and, and he's he is uh, he's able to outwit. And I think that, like when we think about uh, that message to kids that you were talking about, that notion that you know you may not have any superpowers, but you got your smarts. Got you you smart. can outwit other people, and, and you can you can beat the bully. Yeah, is, I think was really beautiful. Yeah, and if you think you're helpless, you are. Right. But if you think you're powerful, you are. Right. And if you think you can or you can't, you're right. So what other uh, magical character, uh, magical characters from our tradition uh, resonate with you? What, who do you love? Oh, let's, well, from our, not exactly magical, but I've always loved the people of Helm. I think the Helm stories are hysterically funny. There's one I, I've worked on. I've done actually two versions of it. One is in uh, The Jar of Fools, and the other is in a new version of Helm stories that just came out, just uh, right, that, stuff, right side up. Um, it's the story of the, uh, of the boot. So the original story is like that. This is, <laughs> this is how I'll take a story. So the original story goes like this. The people of Helm find an old boot. I'm and what is Not everybody it? knows what about Helm. So oh, tell us, tell but us you about don't know Helm. about Helm? What, what? Oy vey. Uh, people of Helm are very foolish. And every culture has its fool stories. But the Helm story is uniquely Jewish because the, Helm, the Helmers are not dumb. They're very intelligent and they're very logical and they, their conclusions flow from one premise to another. There's just one problem. They leave one thing out. And in the end, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. Um, this frankly, I think is, uh, you know, a bit of satire on the rabbinical establishment, just as the Herschel Ostropolia stories are, uh, uh, you know, talk about the rabbinical establishment too, though, in a much more broad-shouldered way. Um, the people of Helm, are the, the Helm stories are kind of very subtle. So what happens? The people of Helm find this object. It's an old boot in the street. What is it? Well, it has a big opening at one end, and there's a little hole at the other end, and it's curved. What do we know that has a big opening at one end and a little opening at the other end? A chauffeur. It must be a chauffeur. So that year at Rosh Hashanah, the people of Helm blew this old boot as a chauffeur. That's the original tale. I mean, that's not a story. That's a joke. <laughs> so in uh, Right Side Up, which is closer to the original story, I kind of play with it. The streets in Helm are muddy, and their farmer, Fonya the farmer, is kind of their uh, the Ukrainian neighbor, who's the voice of common sense in Helm. Fonya comes into town, he gets off his wagon, and uh, he steps into a mud puddle. The streets of Helm are always a mess, and he gets stuck in the mud, and they try to pull him out, and his, one of his boots comes off. Oh, what am I going to do? Now I got to get new, a new boot. Nobody can find his boots. Well, many months later, two children are playing in the street and they find, see something sticking out of the mud. They pull it out. What is it? Well, it's got a big hole in one end, little hole in the other end. It must be a chauffeur. So they clean it up. What is it? Funny is in town again. He says, hey, that's my boot. They say, no, it's a chauffeur. And they bring it to the, uh, the shoemaker. He said, yeah, that's, that's Fania's boot. I recognize all the patches on it. No, 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 it's a chauffeur. Because they've already blown the chauffeur in, uh, at the, in the synagogue for Rosh Hashanah. And they asked the rabbi, right? she says, well, it may at one time have been a boot. But since it's been used for a holy purpose, it is now a chauffeur. And once an object has been used for a holy purpose, it can never go back to being an ordinary object. So it's a chauffeur now, a chauffeur it must remain. And then Fonya says, well, what about my boot? Don't you have to give it back? 
and the rabbi says, well, you know, we do have to give it back or we can pay you its value. So let's say, and here I'm playing with currency. Let's say, uh, you know, a new boot would cost about 15 bubitzes. That's kind of a slang for Russian currency. Um, so let's add three more bubitzes and uh, we'll make it high. Will you accept 18 bubitzes for your boot? Which in the context of the Helm story is a lot of money. He says, 18 bubitzes for my boot? Sure. And the other people at Helm said, what? 18 bubitzes for an old boot? Are you mad? And Fanya says, boot, what are you talking about? It's a chauffeur. I turned the whole thing around. <laughs> See, now that's, that's how you play with a story. You take a fragment, a little joke, and you fool around with it. You extend it. You give it some characters and dialogue, and then you have a story. And I did the same thing with the story in uh, The Jar of Fools, except there it was Hanukkah stories. So it's not a boot. It's a pitchfork that falls off the wagon. And it has nine tines, and one is a little longer than the other. What is that? It's a menorah. So it's the same joke. And I, you know, use the same story twice. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's kind of how my mind thinks. I see a story, I get an idea. Let's play with that. Um, Zigazak was a lot of fun to write. I want to do another Hanukkah demon story. And I came across some stories about Rabbi Soloveitchik, in, uh, in Lithuania, and I thought, yeah, I'll make him the hero of this, because in Herschel Lechanika Goblins, he's just a tramp. Now I'll use a rabbi, and he's not, he's not afraid. That's the thing. It's the same thing. I want to scare you, but I'm not scared, and once I don't scare you, you're, you're in my power. Actually, he squa in my original version, he squashes the devils. That's the end of them. But my editor, Marjorie Kyler, said, nah, don't kill the devils. That'll upset kids. I said, why? They're nasty. And uh, she said, no, 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 don't do it. Marjorie always has good advice. I said, okay. So I just crushed their forms. The spirits went somewhere. Actually, this story comes from Peter the, Gra Peter the Great of Russia. He was at an inn, he used to travel around Russia. Horrible man, but good stories. And he stayed at an inn once and he complimented the innkeeper. He says, you know, every time I come to an inn in my empire, it's always full of cockroaches. I haven't seen a cockroach in this inn at all. How do you keep your inn free of cockroaches? And the innkeeper says, oh, I, I know how to do it. Whenever I catch a cockroach, I impale him on a pin and stick him on the wall as a warning to the other cockroaches. And Peter, who is horrified, terrified of cockroaches, looks around and the whole wall is full of dead and wriggling cockroaches. He lets out a scream, you know, hits the innkeeper over the head with his staff and runs off into the night. <laughs> You know, I collect all these crazy stories. I'm sort of like a big sponge, and uh, every now and then something will come out uh, as, a, as a new and interesting tale. It's really a lot of fun. But I couldn't have done it without my grandma, and because part of that was seeing the Jewish storytelling tradition. Um, you tell a story, and the story is always different every time you tell it. So I'd say to grandma, well, when you told me that, you told me something else. She said, yeah, I know. But that was then, this is now I'm telling you the story. So don't worry about that. Pay attention to now. And there's a lot of truth in that. Um, it comes out of William Faulkner. You know, the past, you know, the past isn't dead. It's not even past. And then there's a Japanese, oh, uh, come on. Um, you, can't step, you can't step into the same river twice. You can't even step into it once because change is all around. So I just like stories and I use a lot of Jewish stories, but I also adapt stories from other cultures and take them, throw them into the mix and see what comes out. It's great to be reminded how rich the Jewish culture is in these stories. Uh, the ones that you heard from you, Baba, and, uh, and the ones that really live in our literature the way you're describing, you're sort of taking the seed and turning it around and telling the opposite story from what the story actually is, uh, is, is exactly the Midrashic tradition. Right? Oh, yeah. and, 
And that is our, that. our, that's our classic uh, uh, Jewish uh, storytelling in, in the sure. rabbinic tradition. Sure. Um, but you see, this, this is an issue with me, Rabbi. So many of our kids don't know our traditions. Okay. And they don't know... know I appreciate I mean, I, you helping to teach it. Uh, and, and well, but but I often you're fighting against it. In um, you know, in, in a recent book I was doing, I made a reference to the uh, the story of Gidon, and from the book of Judges, Shoftim, and uh, our editor said, "Nah, change it to Joshua because our kids don't know who Gidon is." And I mean, my gosh, you don't know your Bible, you don't know your stories, you don't know the book of Judges. Well, I have to tell you my, my Bible story. I love I love uh, Tanakh, but especially uh, Shoftim and Malachim, because that's where the really the bloody stories are. I, I still have it over there. I could pull it out, but I won't. Uh, when I was about seven or eight years old, my uncle Abe who was a friend of the family. Stopped by a yard sale, and he bought I think for. for what, a quarter each, two huge volumes of the what was called the Old Testament. And they were just enormous, but they had the Jacques Tissot illustration. Jacques Tissot was a very famous Victorian illustrator. And this book was stunning. And it was full of all these lurid pictures. Um guys getting their heads chopped off when you're in in a shelf team i mean it's all murder and mayhem there and here it was illustrated <laughs> so i mean when when you're in uh shmuel um you know uh, david's henchmen go out and they capture uh one of uh, King Shaul's sons, and you know, there they are presenting his head to David, and there's is the guy's head on the pavement. Um, there's all sorts of blood and slaughter and going on, and I'm like about eight years old. I'm just staring at this stuff, and I knew if my parents really knew what was in that book, they'd probably take it away. So <laughs> careful. So I'd be up in my room looking at these gorgeous, gory pictures. And my mother would call up, what are you doing up there? I said, I'm reading. She says, what are you reading? And then I put on my pious voice, I'm reading the Bible. And you say, you're reading the Bible. They leave you alone. What part of the Bible are you reading? Yeah, I'm doing the one about the Levite's concubine from, uh, from Shelfton. There's all sorts of wild stuff. If you only knew what was in the Bible. Uh, it's wonderful, one, wonderful book. So I grew up with this and I love Jewish history. See, the thing I don't think your kid, our kids know, or at least they don't appreciate, you see something on... Uh, Netflix about uh, Egyptian archaeology. We were there. Ancient Greece, Rome, we were there. Arabian Nights, we were there. You name it, as far back as history goes, I mean, unless you're in the Neolithic period, we were there. They were Jewish people. And that vast panorama of history is what I draw on when I write a book. And I want to make it exciting. As it's always been for me. That's that. That is beautiful, and all of those experiences, uh, and all of that history, and all of that encounter with so many different cultures, made its way into our stories. And, yes. Uh, and, and it's so it, it is. It's beautiful how we uh, how we just incorporate that, and 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 when and we teach morals through our storytelling. Stories. We, we teach the yeah. Jewish ideology through our storytelling, so uh, it's 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 really it's really powerful. So I'm grateful to you for your for your storytelling and for bringing it, uh, continuing to update these the, these ideas and bringing them into new audiences, uh, where people can pick up the you know a book like like Zigzag and say, I never knew it was Jewish. Who knew? <laughs> So beautiful. We've got time really for uh, like one, one or two questions. If anybody uh, would like to, to, uh, to jump on and uh, ask Eric Kimmel, this is your moment. Yeah, go for it. I love to talk. I could do it for hours. <laughs> Anyone? 
My name is. You did have someone put in the chat a question of um, what what was on the cutting room floor. What happened to the other five goblins? Oh, what happened to the other goblins? Let's see. One was a big cat. The other I got from uh, Brian Frude's book of fairies. He had one leg, one eye, and one arm. Um, and I forget what the third one was. Um, no, they weren't my favorites. I kept the ones that I liked the best. So if you're really interested, the one manuscript uh, is in the, uh, the archive library at uh, Keene College in Keene, in Keene State uh, College at Keene, New Hampshire. My friend David White uh, was the librarian there and uh, you know, he was always a friend and supporter. So I said, here, David, this is for your archive. Um, the important goblin state. Wanna hear a good story about the goblins? You know, the third one with the big nose and the little noses on it. Well, I never wrote that he has a big nose with little noses. So when I saw the picture, I said to the artist, Trina Hyman, I said, where'd that come from? I didn't write that. She said, and I said, that's creepy. She said, you think it's creepy in the picture? You should have seen it in real life. I said, you ran into a guy with a nose like that? She said, yeah, I was on a vacation in France. I was driving around Normandy and I stopped to get gas at this little village where I guess everybody's been marrying their cousins for 500 years. And the guy at the gas station came out to fill my tank and he had this big red drinker's nose with all these little noses on it that I guess are his genetic, uh, genetically malformed brothers, sisters. And I felt terrible for the poor man to have to go through life like that. But at the same time, I thought I can use this. So <laughs> after, after I had my, uh, I got gas, I drove down the road a few miles, pulled over, got out my sketch pad and I sketched that nose. And when I got back to New Hampshire, your manuscript was there. And I thought, ah, big red goblin, that's where the nose goes. You hear all these wonderful stories. You keep the stories and the artists keep the, uh, keep the drawings. Oh, the yeah. Artists, whatever comes in. Actually, the authors and the artists have very little to do with each other. And in many cases, I've had zero communication with the artist. Wow. And I don't even get to see the pictures till the book is about done. And I've mm -hmm. always been uh, delighted because they think of things that would never have crossed my mind. People say, you know, but is what the artist drew what you were thinking of? And I said, no, it never is. But then uh, the only way I would get my own pictures would be to go to art school. <laughs> That's the truth, you know? Okay. Create the story and then you turn it over to somebody else. When I read the story to you without showing the pictures, you're seeing your pictures in your head and the kid next to you is seeing a different set of pictures, but they all work with the story and that's what matters. Is there another question? Yeah, Nettie, I think you were, you were starting to ask a question. And mute. It wasn't really a question, it's just very exciting to meet you. Um, you. I'm from the East Coast. I have been reading this book <laughs> with students since uh, what, 1989, 1990? That's when it came out. <laughs> I was in a high school and they had a preschool and they invited me every Hanukkah down to the preschool and I'd read them that story. <laughs> oh, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let me pick up on that. I've had any number of uh, kids who were people who've encountered the book as kids uh, come up to me and say, you know, thanks for that book, because it's the only book that can hold its own with the Christmas stuff. Yes. And before it's like, uh, yeah, we read some nice, cute little Jewish story about spinning dreidels and things like that. And, you know, well, the non-Jewish kids listen politely and uh, you know, let's get on to the really good stuff. <laughs> and with Herschel, the whole class is paying attention. Wow, that's a terrific story. All and all the Jewish eyes. kids are saying, <laughs> I'm glad you like it, but you know, I relate to this story in a way that nobody else in this room does. This is my story. I'm glad to share it, but it's mine. Um, 
And so, uh, I mean, I've always felt wonderful when somebody shares that that uh, with me. And I've heard I've heard it a lot. That's so great. Thank you, Nettie. And uh, someone uh, mentioned a story about a Hanukkah bear. Oh yeah, the Hanukkah bear. I've got it right here. Tell us about that story. I don't know it. Oh, you don't know this one. Well, this was originally called the Hanukkah Guest. It came out in the 90s and had a good long run. And then it was going to go out of print. But uh, one of my editors at Holiday House said, no, that book is a classic. You can't let it go out of print. But it does look a little dated. And maybe it's time for some new illustrations. So wonderful artist Mike Winutka created new pictures for it. And the story is... Well, Babrena doesn't hear or see as well as she should. And a bear shows up at the house. He thinks it's the she thinks it's the rabbi, and invites him in for Hanukkah. They play dreidel, eat the latkes, and she only realizes that it's a bear when her guests show up. There's the rabbi. Boba Brena says, "Rabbi, there's an imposter going around. He looks like you. He talks like you. He even has your beard." I mean, this was great fun. Uh, again, this is a story out of my grandma. My grandma's Boba Brena, and she loved bears. We'd go to the zoo. We'd go to see the bears because she think, seemed to think that the bear was as homesick for the forest and the country as she was because that's where she grew up. And it also comes out of Mr. Magoo cartoons, which I loved. That's another cross-cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And the joke with Mr. Magoo is he's nearsighted and doesn't know what's going on around him. And he walks into these terrifying situations. But, you know, he thinks he's out for a walk in the park, even though he's crossing the freeway or walking into the lion's cage in the zoo. And when I was a kid, I thought those were hysterically funny. I just laugh and laugh. Um, so I put them together. And out comes Hanukkah Bear. And there's another personal thing in here. There's a lot of personal stuff that you never hear. Um, it's this joke. They're saying the brachot. And Baba Brena asks the bear, the rabbi, to say the brachot. Baba Brena struck a match and lit the Shamus candle. Then she lit the one for the first night. Old bear muttered and growled. Oh, Rabbi, you say the brachot so beautifully. <laughs> and the funny thing was, this was my dad. My grandfather was, I mean, he was from the opposite end of the social scale that my grandma was from. She was an Austro-Hungarian. He was a Russian. Um, she came from a wealthy family with uh, a lot of uh, rabbinical connections. He was an orphan with nothing. Uh, could barely read or write. My, my father's mother was illiterate. She couldn't read. And uh, he was too cheap to give his kids a real Jewish education. It was just the cheda, um, you know, with some broken down individual who just tried to beat uh, Hebrew into the kids. And so my dad's grasp, he was a very proud Jewish person, but his grasp of uh, Hebrew was rather limited. So when we'd have Passover Seder or Hanukkah and he'd have to say the brachot, he'd mutter, he'd go, like that. And my brother and I had a very good Jewish education. We would laugh, you know, we'd nudge each other and he's, he's mumbling his way through it. And grandma would insist that we do everything with her dialect. And my brother and I were doing in Spartak. So, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was a, a mishmash of different Hebrew dialects around. So um, Bear and the old lady, oh, that's a bit of a, that was our Seder table. Rabbi, you say the blessing so beautifully. Yes, daddy, you know, <laughs> say it again. <laughs> that's that's really that's terrific and you're bringing not only jewish tradition but your own family and your own experiences into these stories oh yeah well when you're a writer you do that yeah. you know everything is grist for the mill throw it in if it'll make a story more exciting so much the better because writing is hard enough if you're not having a good time with the story why are you bothering with it 
<laughs> if the only answer you give is, well, because I'm getting paid, well, then you're a hack. What can I say? <laughs> you're selling your soul. But uh, if you were true to your soul, you'd have a lot more fun and the work would go a lot more easily. Eric Kimmel, we are grateful to you and grateful that you bring your soul uh, into everything that you do and you share it with us and enrich us. We, uh, we look forward to, to more stories. Uh, we hope there's, there's, uh, uh, there, there is certainly lots more material out there. Oh, there will be. I'm doing graphic novels now. Um, one's coming out next Hanukkah. And uh, right now I'm working with an Israeli artist, Avi Katz. We're doing a, uh, well, if it ever becomes a book, but we're having fun. Uh, it's going to be like a Jewish Game of Thrones in the ninth century. It's the Khazar Chronicles, and the first, the first book in the story is the Maze of the Mummies. Oh, we got all kinds of stuff going on. Dragon, That's fantastic. Mummy. Next time you're at Temple, I'll show you our dragon. We actually have one. It, oh boy, gotta see it. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you will you will enjoy this very much and it's actually one that's been around for a long time so uh, oh i will i can't wait <laughs> our our temple our, our historic sanctuary with its own dragon oh, uh, boy. <laughs> eric kimmel thank you so much for being with us real pleasure to be with oh, you my pleasure uh, rabbi anytime i'm we'll, glad we'll, to do it lots of fun thank we'll, you for we'll, inviting we'll, me we'll, and happy, everyone, happy new year you as well hanukkah sameach enjoy your last day of Hanukkah, and may we continue to bring brightness. Um, may we continue to be a shamas and, and uh, give light to all who are in need uh, and tell our stories. Um, oh, thank you so much. Bye you. now. Thank you. Hanukkah Sameach. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks.